So I have a lot of videos on my channel talking about how we use isotopes to date rocks, specifically how we use radioactive isotopes and how they decay over time at a constant rate to radiometrically or numerically date rocks or determine their age. But in those past videos, I've often kind of brushed past the mechanisms behind ensuring that these rocks begin with only parent or radioactive isotope and no radiogenic or daughter product isotope. But how exactly does that work? A lot of you have asked this exact question in my comment sections on those videos. How do isotopes kind of set or reset their composition in these rocks when they form or become metamorphosed? So before I jump right into how isotopes reset, I want to kind of lay the foundations of like how we date rocks with radiometric dating, how it actually works to calculate an age for a rock. Um, basically, we can measure a rock's isotope ratio to then calculate its age. So first I'm gonna briefly describe what isotopes are, so we all are on the same page, and then I'll talk about how and why this isotope ratio measurement works to get an age for the rock. Basically, every element has an atomic number. That means its number of protons that it has in its nucleus. And the number of protons, in this case, defines the element. If the number of protons in a nucleus is six, the element is carbon. If the number of protons changes from six to seven, it's no longer carbon, it's now nitrogen. But in atoms, the nucleus or nuclei hold both protons and neutrons. And if the number of neutrons changes, then it is a different isotope of that element. So for example, carbon has three common isotopes, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Not all isotopes are radioactive. In other words, not all isotopes are unstable and decay over time. Carbon 14 is the radioactive isotope of carbon that does decay over time. It has eight neutrons and six protons, so it's called carbon-14 because those add up to 14. But carbon-12 and 13, with six neutrons and seven neutrons respectively, are stable. They are not unstable, therefore they don't decay over time into a different isotope. So what actually is radioactive decay? Well, it's the spontaneous atomic transformation of a radioactive or unstable parent isotope into a stable daughter product, plus the release of energy in the process. So ultimately, because of the number of neutrons in the nucleus in these radioactive isotopes, they are just unstable at that you know, number of neutrons and protons together in that nucleus. So over time they decay and they decay into a stable daughter isotope. Because radioactive isotopes, thankfully for us, decay at constant rates, we can define their half-lives. Half-lives are just the time required for half the parent isotope, half the radioactive isotope, to decay into the daughter or radiogenic isotope. For example, we can see with carbon-14 here, the radioactive isotope of carbon, as it decays, it starts at 100% carbon-14 in the rock, and then after one half-life on the x-axis here, 50% remains, or five grams from 10 grams, and then 25%, 12.5%, and so on with every half-life the amount halves. Because we know the half-lives of common isotope systems used for radiometric dating, like carbon-14 decay, potassium-40 decay, uranium-238 to lead-206, or uranium-205 to lead-207, or rubidium-87 to strontium-87 decay. All of these decay processes are really commonly used, or I should say isotope systems are really commonly used in radiometric dating. And because of that, we have calculated, measured and calculated their half-lives. Because we know their half-lives, we can then go up to the rock, take it back to our lab, measure the ratio of parent to daughter isotope in the rock, and estimate how many half-lives have gone by and thus how many years have passed since it formed. Note some of these systems have half-lives so geologically short that the age of rocks that can be dated using them is limited. For example, carbon decay, because its half-life is much shorter than, for example, these other systems, it's only about 
uh, 5.7 thousand rather than like a billion or 4.5 billion. That means after about 50,000 years, all the parent carbon should, you know, have been decayed by then. <laughs> and therefore we cannot get a ratio of parent to daughter isotope in that rock with the carbon. We need both parent and daughter to be present to get a ratio. So what types of rocks does radiometric dating work best with? Well, it works best with igneous rocks because melting and crystallization tends to reset the isotopic clock. In other words, for example, if you try to radiometrically date metamorphic rocks, which have undergone major high pressure, high temperature alteration, and not full melting, but almost <laughs> melting, um, because they've undergone that alteration, that tends to reset the isotopic clock. And therefore, if you try and date metamorphic rocks, you're actually dating the time of metamorphism, uh, or alteration rather than the original rocks formation before metamorphism. So this brings us to the whole concept of this video, which is how do these isotopes reset upon melting and or metamorphism? First things first, what does resetting the clock mean? Well, it just means that it brings the rock back to a composition of 100% parent daughter isotope and no daughter isotope. In other words, in this rock, diagram example, all the isotopes here are red, or the parent, <laughs> and there are no black ones, even though they began to form, and then it melted and brought it back to purely parent isotope. Then once it recrystallizes with this composition, that begins the decay of this parent back into the daughter isotope. Thus, that moment of crystallization after the melting is the moment that we date as its birthday. So when we find it, we assume the parent to daughter isotope ratio represents the amount of daughter isotope formed since that moment, since that crystallization. But this is a big assumption to make without backing. So how do we know that this resetting occurs and what are the underlying mechanisms of such resetting? The primary process that resets isotopic clocks upon melting and crystallization is diffusion. In melts, in other words, melted rocks beneath our surface, atoms are mobile and they can diffuse or move through the rock. This is often how larger grains, called phenocrysts, in smaller grained matrices form in igneous and metamorphic rocks. In igneous rocks, for example, within the magma chamber, the atoms diffuse to a nucleation site where a crystal is growing. And if the melt remains melted for a long time, these atoms or ions have a long time to diffuse to that nucleation site. When things crystallize very quickly, in other words, the melt crystallizes very quickly or is brought to the surface by volcanism and is cooled very fast at our surface, these atoms or ions don't have time to diffuse through the melt and to a larger nucleation site, so instead they crystallize right where they are. And so there's a bunch of tiny grains instead of a few very large grains. Same thing with metamorphism. If a metamorphic rock is undergoing alteration for an extended period of time and it's undergoing such high temperature and pressure alteration that diffusion is allowed, the diffusion of ions will often form new crystals, like this is often how garnet and starlight can form and schists, and this is because the diffusion of ions goes to these larger crystals when it has an extended period of time for that to happen. Here's an example picture of garnet and schist. You can see how much bigger these grains are compared to the finer grained schist matrix of mica, and then olivine here in this basalt is an example of uh, how that might happen in igneous materials. In any case, the movement of ions to and from grains during melting and alteration can also lead to the loss or gain of certain isotopes, because each one of these ions represents a specific isotope. Such isotopic diffusion, as it's called, <laughs> aptly named, uh, resets the clock for isotopic systems that are prone to diffusive exchange. Because the daughter isotopes, in this example the blue dots or lead, diffuse out of the crystal during melting or alteration, allowing the parent isotopes, in this case the red dots or uranium, to diffuse back into the crystal. This is for reasons I'll talk about later in the video, which is incompatible versus compatible elements in crystal structures, and it's largely due to the crystal lattice and how it's structured and what 
ionic sizes it likes to fit in its crystal versus which ones it doesn't like. You can probably see where I'm going to go with this, um, but I'll talk about that later in the video. First, I want to address what I just said here, that is, this type of mechanism, isotopic diffusion, resets the clock for isotopic systems that are prone to diffusive exchange. So this would lead us to think that maybe isotopic systems less prone to isotopic diffusion are not good for radiometric dating then. Actually, that's not the case. These systems apparently are more robust for radiometric dating or are considered more robust. And I'm saying this in this way, in this order, because this is what I was assuming going into this. You guys asked me this question so much and I didn't, I knew a little bit about the diffusion process, but I didn't fully understand it. And now that I've looked into it, I just find it mind boggling how intricate these systems are and how cool this works. So anyway, let me keep going and then we'll get to the end, which is like super mind blowing and cool. Um, so these systems are considered more robust. Why? Well, because the isotopic clock is less likely to be disturbed or reset during periods of alteration or metamorphism, resulting in therefore more reliable original ages. So if you want to date a metamorphic rock and you want to obtain the metamorphic age, the timing of metamorphism for that whole region that's been metamorphosed potentially, then you should pick an isotopic system prone to resetting. And we know which ones those are because we can do experiments and measure, you know, which ones are more likely to reset all these things. So you should pick one that's prone to that. If you want to obtain the original age before metamorphism, you should probably pick one less prone to resetting. These are systems that have high blocking temperatures. The blocking temperature is the temperature below which isotopic diffusion is significantly restricted. So isotopic systems with high blocking temperature are less prone to isotopic exchange because it takes a higher and higher temperature to allow isotopic diffusion. In other words, like full melting rather than just, you know, metamorphism in this diagram I'm trying to emulate uh, contact metamorphism around a magma chamber here in these sediment layers um, that are kind of don't look like sediment layers um, but you know you get the picture so the the systems with high blocking temperature don't allow isotopic diffusion in the metamorphic zone but by the time they're melted they do allow it an example of this is zircon zircon is a mineral with very high blocking temperature especially with regards to its uranium lead contents, meaning that it makes it more resistant to isotopic disturbance. In other words, its uranium and lead ratios stay relatively consistent in periods of alteration and contact and regional metamorphism, whereas other minerals and or mineral isotopic system combinations might be more prone to diffusion even in the metamorphic scenarios. Thus, when we go and date zircon, we are pretty certain that we're dating uh, the last period that it fully recrystallized from a full melt rather than just an alteration period. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're not careful to pick zircons and other minerals that clearly haven't undergone alteration, but we can compare those to altered formations uh, or those minerals contained within altered formations to get a sense of which ones are prone and which ones are not prone to isotopic resetting. It's also important to note that isotopic systems behave uniquely in different minerals. For example, the lead uranium system in zircon is generally less prone to resetting, while the potassium argon isotopic system in feldspar can be more vulnerable to alteration. When dating rocks, therefore, we consider mineral type, susceptibility to isotopic exchange, and the isotopic system being used. Because we can consider all these factors, we can really aim at getting something that will give us a robust original age of crystallization versus something that will give us date of alteration. Sometimes that's the goal, to get the timing of metamorphism or alteration, and sometimes we want the date of original crystallization uh, and so on. So we can kind of really refine this using specific minerals with specific isotopes. But here's the question that I know you guys have already started typing out in the comments. If these systems are less susceptible to isotopic diffusion, then how do we know that the rocks started out with only parent and no daughter isotopes? How do we know 
that the daughter isotopes, when it was in the melt, had diffused out and away from that crystal. If the rock contained initial daughter isotopes upon formation, it would falsely indicate an age much older, potentially, than the rock actually is. So there's several methods that we use to minimize the initial daughter isotope effect, or the potential for initial daughter isotopes being incorporated at formation. And these are often very dependent on the mineral and isotope system being used. Um, for example, the first method we use is to select the mineral and isotopic system carefully. For example, like I mentioned earlier, the selection of minerals that exclude or reject daughter isotopes during formation is key for reducing or minimizing this potential. An example of this, again, is zircon. Zircon's really good <laughs> for radiometric dating. I always wondered why, and now making this video, I understand why. Um, and monazite, which incorporate very little lead uh, during formation, making them very favorable for uranium lead dating. We also can run lead loss or gain models, uh, which Basically, in certain isotope systems like uranium lead system, it's known that lead can be lost or gained from certain minerals during alteration, and models can therefore assess whether any lead has been lost or gained from the system. This helps in correcting age calculations. Basically, one way that we do this, one very common way of kind of correcting or seeing any potential contamination or alteration that led to lead loss or gain in a system is by isochron dating. Basically, we use multiple isotopic systems and or samples from the same rock or formation of rock to create an isochron plot. If the data points align along the isochron linear you know, path, that implies that there was minimal initial daughter isotopes or contamination, whereas if there's deviations, like shown here, the presence of initial daughter isotopes or contaminants is possible. So we can do this with all sorts of isotope systems, but just for the purpose of this video, I'm focusing on uranium lead because there's the most examples uh, with those and the most figures that I could find. Basically, if we look here to the graph at the right, I'm sorry, left, <laughs> uh, we can see deviation of the isotope data to the right of the isochron, which indicates that the uranium-235 to lead-207 ratios are higher or preferentially higher than the uranium-238 to lead-206 ratios in the rock. Both uh, systems are valid isotopic systems for radiometric dating due to the decay of 235 and 238 into these separate daughter products. However, this deviation to the right indicates that there may have been initial lead 207 incorporated in the rock, making those ratios larger than they should be and deviating from the path. I'll talk more about corrections and isochrons later, but just to get through the rest of the methods used to minimize initial daughter isotope effect, we also take multiple, this is key, taking multiple rocks from each section or each locality of the formation we're looking at, calculating multiple ages for you know, multiple spots on each mineral sample that we take, which should result in agreement of all the ages in the same mineral sample and agreeing chronological ages up section in the section we're looking at. And often this is not done in each study, rather it's done by many people worldwide from different independent labs, which then, you know, publish their data, making these huge subsets of data from every place imaginable on Earth that could be dated. And this leads to very robust data, especially when things are measured in independent labs, which greatly reduces chances of laboratory or sample prep contamination if everything agrees. Also, with time, these methods are continually refined and new measurements are added to corroborate old ones and so on and so on. So they just keep getting better. So now I want to jump into the more chemical uh, explanation of why, well, it's not that, it's not that complex, actually. It's kind of like whether things fit or not into a mineral. <laughs> so it's really, um, it's more structural and it's very simple. So incompatibility versus compatibility is kind of the thing that governs how we know that for the most part, parent isotope is incorporated in the beginning, in the crystal formation, and not daughter. Basically, there's compatible and there's incompatible elements. If 
you didn't get that from what I said already. <laughs> Compatible elements readily fit into crystal lattices of minerals as they crystallize. Now, I should mention here, compatible elements might be compatible for some minerals and not others. So it's like, if an element is compatible for blank mineral, it doesn't mean it's compatible for a different mineral. So like, don't think that a compatible element is always compatible. But if we're thinking of one system, for example, zircon with uranium and lead, the uh, compatible element here is uranium, the parent isotope. It fits readily, its ionic size fits readily into the mineral lattice of zircon. This is typically due to, well, I just said ionic size. Basically, the crystal lattices are these set structures that minerals have. There are, of course, amorphous minerals, um, but most especially those that are crystallizing out of a melt have a set, uniform, repeated atomic structure, which can only fit certain ions into its structure. Incompatible elements are those that do not easily fit into the mineral lattices and they're therefore kind of rejected from the mineral. The reason is because they have different ionic sizes than those of the ions in the mineral lattice. Therefore, they cannot easily replace the ions within the atomic structure of that mineral. Therefore, if they were in the crystal due to decay of an isotope over time, such as lead and zircon, when it melts, they are rejected from the mineral because it's just not thermodynamically or kinetically favorable for that mineral to have that in the crystal lattice. So they're rejected. Or if the mineral hadn't formed yet, um, as it's forming within the melt, it actively avoids, you know, favoring any lead uh, incorporation. And it does favor uranium incorporation just because that fits into its structure. So the daughter isotopes in this scenario, which are the incompatible ones, remain in the melt uh, portion of the magma chamber as minerals crystallize, whereas the parent isotopes like uranium in this scenario are incorporated into the solidifying crystals that are forming in the magma chamber early on. This is great for us because it means that the daughter isotopes that we measure when we go and measure the daughter to parent ratio are from post-formation parent isotope decay. But then what does that mean about those minerals that crystallize from the remaining melt? If lead or other daughter isotopes are just getting more and more concentrated in the remaining melt, then how do we avoid that? Or how do the crystals forming later in the magma chamber avoid incorporating those daughter isotopes? This is where the answer is simple. We just don't use those minerals. Minerals that crystallize last from the remaining melt are more susceptible to daughter incorporation, obviously, because it's just so concentrated at that point. However, we can just choose to select and use the minerals for dating that form early in melts. Why or how do we know which minerals are gonna form first versus which are gonna form after? Well, in short, um, I abbreviated here BRS, Bowen's reaction series. Like this is, a, I guess, an invitation to go check out my igneous petrology playlist. Basically, we know from thermodynamics which crystals are gonna solidify from a magma chamber first because each mineral composition has its own temperature uh, that becomes reached where it decides to solidify out of the magma chamber or out of the melt. So we can just choose to use the minerals and crystals that form first and those that have structures and crystal lattices that really hate incorporating the daughter isotope in the system that we use and or we can correct for the initial incorporation of daughter isotopes in maybe later formed crystals. Corrections are performed on raw isotope data to account for many factors, many things that can influence isotopic values, including initial daughter isotopes, as we've been talking about, isotopic fractionation, like loss or gain of certain isotopes, decay constant updates. Um, decay constants or half-lives are often not drastically, but like slightly updated with more refined data and more data that we have today. And those can add into the mathematical corrections that we then carry out on our raw data. Uh, instrument drift, this is just a complete, you know, we always have to account for instrumental drift um, and other instrumental factors that come into play when we're using our instruments. And contamination, again, sometimes contamination is not uh, avoidable. And so we can uh, understand the means and the averages regarding contamination of certain elements and certain minerals and account for that uh, accordingly. Such correction processes include things like careful sample preparation and selection, 
testing to identify contaminants, and isochron plots, again, which identify and can help subtract initial daughter isotope effects, and we can use our most updated decay constants. Such corrections, in addition to measuring, again, I keep saying this, measuring multiple samples from each rock and multiple rocks from each section, really help to refine our age estimates. Another factor that might not be as scientific or chemical or geochemical is just peer review. I don't think people really fully understand the intricacies and the difficulty of peer review, at least for good journals. In summary, experts review papers to determine whether reliable methods were used and if the paper should be published based on its methods and data and interpretations. This weeds out any unreliable or bad data and those that might accidentally get through, those bad data that might get through and get published are often found later um, because you've got readers that are typically also experts in the field that find problems with it and that either leads to an amendment or correction of that paper that's added on later um, because these journals are typically online and so they can be edited and or a retraction of that uh, paper and data. Also in science, nothing's ever one and done. Many measurements, as I mentioned earlier, um, and age estimates are made from each deposit on Earth, basically, that can be dated with different isotope systems, different minerals, and in different labs with different techniques. Disagreement can indicate that there's either contamination or natural processes that must be explained in the text of the publication that's publishing that data uh, and confirmed by future studies and or it's just incorrect and should not be published. This is something that the review process often catches. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about how certain minerals can either incorporate or not incorporate certain isotopes depending on compatibility and incompatibility during their formation and how that helps us through forming these robust isotopic clocks for us. And yeah, if you guys have any more questions, my references are going to be linked down below as always, and I will um, try and answer as many as I can in the comments. I hope that there's somebody that's a geochemist watching this so you can help answer comments, especially somebody that specializes in geochronology. I myself have done research with isotopes, but stable isotopes, light stable isotopes, not radioactive ones. So I am not an expert in geochronology, but I found this topic really interesting, and a lot of you guys kept commenting, asking how the heck these isotopes reset. So I hope that helps and I will see you guys next time. Bye.